next speaker is our colleague, uh, researcher in the mm -hmm. Hamburger College, Jan Christoph uh, Jan Christoph Zontkop is a political scientist. He received his PhD at Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich. And uh, for five years already, is it so long? Yeah. He's been employed here as a researcher and a very valuable colleague in the center. Uh, he's published a book which I am sure could interest many of us about form and wonder the Französisch and intellectual, especially you, John. And uh, now he's working on his habilitation project, a very ambitious habilitation project, on the grammar of conflicts of legal culture. But today he will tell us why respect the law, two kind theory of democracy and political legitimacy. Thank you. Yeah, I start directly. Um, Ime Durkheim's influence on contemporary legal studies, especially on those inspired by a cultural perspective on the social world, is undisputable. Even if there are hardly any of his reflections that are accepted without criti criticism and adaptation, he certainly enriched our understanding of the symbolic dimension of penal law, the integrative and commemorative functions of legal rituals and procedures, the sacralization of the human person at the foundation of human rights, and many other subjects. Nevertheless, Durkheim did not care much about the concrete creation and production of law, but was rather concerned with the evolution and function of law in differently developed kinds of society. And as we already heard yesterday, given the fact that Durkheim never conceived a genuine political sociology, concerned with the basic institutions and dynamics of the political process, it is no surprise that his remarks on the democratic procedure of lawmaking remain sketchy and often unsatisfactory. Max Weber, in contrast, is another founding father of sociology whose writings on politics are never missing in standard textbooks on the history of political ideas and on political sociology. But while Weber developed a very determinate conception of politics, the struggle for power that is in the end a reflection of the heroic battle about fundamental values, Durkheim as a sociological analyst never had to look for this agonistic side of politics. <coughs> Even if he could not avoid becoming involved as an intellectual into the deep ideological battles of the French Third Republic that became most obvious during the Dreyfus affair. Yet, despite these flaws, Durkheim has conceived a theory of democracy within his Les de Sociologie, a book that is, however, often overshadowed by his major works. Referring to the subtitle of our conference, I'm inclined to say there hardly is a legacy worth speaking of in this case, or to remain in the French tradition, the influence of Durkheim's theory of democracy is on quelque façon nul. Certainly, the Durkheim specialist in this room and elsewhere, especially Hans-Peter Müller, um, who was invited but unfortunately um, could not come, um, have not passed over his political reflections. But if you have a look at some of the most important and rather comprehensive standard books about the history and contemporary task of democratic theory, for example, works by Giovanni Sartori or David Held or Manfred e. Schmidt and many others, Durkheim is absolutely absent. Slight traces of a Durkheim reception in political science can only be found in the French discussion, for example in some theories of republicanism and, as I will show, um, models of a reflective or deliberative democracy. The most important example is certainly Pierre Rosan Vallon's book about democratic legitimacy, as it transcends the French political context both in its aims general search for new categories of democratic legitimacy and in its audience, having been translated in several languages including German and English. Rosan Vallon not only refers, albeit seldom, to Durkheim, but his main criteria of legitimacy, impartiality, reflexivity and proximity show an interesting affiliation to Durkheim's thought. So, the aim of my presentation is very modest. I want to reconstruct Durkheim's theory of democracy and analyze how his insights and perspectives can be, re can be related to contemporary discussions about democratic legitimacy, even if these debates hardly refer to Durkheim. 
directly related to the discussion of political legitimacy is of course the question why the citizens should obey the law and accept authority. A question that surfaces repeatedly in Durkheim's observations without being systematically addressed, such as in the Weberian fashion. To approach Durkheim's understanding of democracy, it might be useful to underline that he is strictly concerned with the democratic regime on the state level, not on a local or transnational level. Thus, democracy is a relation between state, as we heard yesterday, um, defined as a separate entity composed of officials with the main function of creating laws and binding representations, as Durkheim calls it, between state and society. Durkheim's rather idiosyncratic definition of democracy is a provocative blow against the common view and the etymology of the word that political autonomy, government by the people, self-government is the core of democracy. Democracy as self-government is a superficial mystification to him, as historically it has always been a minority being in charge of the political affairs, independent of the monarchic, aristocratic, or democratic form of government. Numbering tribal forms of collective rule-making among the label democracy <coughs> is an anachronistic point of view to Durkheim. In electoral democracies, very often the parliamentary, parliamentary majority is not backed by the majority of votes due to a multi-party system and electoral abstinence, and sometimes even the whole parliament represents fewer votes than the combina combination of non-voters and votes for non-elected candidates, as Durkheim argues for the elections of 1893. This large non-representation becomes even more obvious with regard to the citizens deprived of suffrage. In France, women have not been granted the right to vote until 1944, like, on, like in many other places in the world, of course. Even if democracy was on some occasions a realization of majority rule, this would not be a criterion of good government, as Durkheim makes it utterly clear following Tocqueville that, I quote, a majority can be as oppressive as a caste. So counting numbers like Aristotle and Montesquieu and many others is not the right way to distinguish between political systems, which he underlines with an ambivalent remark concerning the difference of aristocratic and democratic regimes. I quote, if we confine ourself, ourselves to numbers, we have to admit that there has never been a democracy. At the very most, we might say, to show where it differs from an aristocracy, that under an aristocratic system, the governing minority are established once and for all, whereas in a democracy, the minority that carries the day may be beaten tomorrow and replaced by another. The difference then between them is only slight." End of quote. So most of us would certainly agree that the slight difference is not entirely useless to the control of political government that can be per periodically removed. Durkheim, in contrast, is not impressed by this idea of accountability and even argues in these lectures not only against the idea of an imperative mandate discussed at this time, but also generally against the direct election of representatives. Another quote. From the moment that we have the citizens electing their representatives direct, that is, in electing those members with most influence in the governmental organ, it becomes inevitable for these representatives to apply themselves almost exclusively to a faithful promotion of their constituents' views. It is also inevitable for these constituents to claim this docile attitude as an obligation. Does it not amount to a mandate negotiated between the two parties? True, it might be in the nature of higher policy to consider that those governing should enjoy a good deal of initiative and that it is only on those terms that they can carry out their given task. But there is a force of circumstances against which even the best reasoning cannot prevail. As long as the political order places the deputies and, as a rule, governments in immediate contact with the mass of citizens, it is practically impossible that these latter should not make the laws. End of quote. So in these revealing remarks that lead um, to the plea for an electoral procedure with several stages um, with professional organizations as mediators, 
we can now find a normative and not as before an, an empirical argument against democracy as the unmediated expression of the will of the people. So what for many theorists of democracy is the main task, that is to search for ways of including citizens into and connecting them to the lawmaking process, is simply abhorred by Durkheim. This choice is motivated by his normative conception of the state that directly engraves his understanding of democracy. Not the numbers of rulers or instruments as elections are essential, but in the end, the level of rationality and enlightenment. I quote, Seen from this point, a democracy may then appear as the political system by which the, the society can achieve a consciousness of itself in its purest form. The more that deliberation and reflection and the critical spirit play a considerable part in the course of public affairs, the more democratic the nation. It is the less democratic when lack of consciousness, uncharted customs, the obscure sentiments and prejudices that even that evade investigation predominate." End of quote. This passage must be very attractive to supporters of, this, of a discursive or deliberative democracy, the most fashionable democratic model since about the 1980s. When Rainer Faust, for example, defines democracy as the rule of reasons, this seems to be in line with Durkheim's ideal. This somehow mentalist conception of democracy is a consequent step given the fact that Durkheim from the start is not concerned with a separation of powers, but with a process of deliberation and also communication. Durkheim makes it explicitly clear that the communicative relations between state and society must be close to avoid political and moral pathologies. Moreover, close communication between these two entities become a further criterion of democracy. Of course, this use of communication is far from the epistemology of system theory, but it seems to harmonize perfectly with newer theoretical attempts to reconfigure our concepts of democracy and sovereignty of the people. Habermas and others do not think of democracy as a kind of embodied decision-making or as a concrete will of the material people, as Volk of Deutsch, but as purely procedural. In Habermas' words, subjectless and anonymous <coughs> and intersubjectively dissolved popular sovereignty withdraws into democratic procedures and the demanding communicative presuppositions of their implementation." End of quote. So the subjectless forms of communication replace the imagery of a sovereignty embodied by a ruler, a people, or even an assembly. This is the radical, radical move of a Volkssouveränität als Verfahren, the virtues and flaws of which I will not discuss here. Durkheim is indeed astonishingly progressive to bring streams of communication, and not as the French political right of his time, for example, and even of today, a mythical con concept of people or nation to the core of his theory of democracy. Yet, this insight does not lead to a consequently disembodied form of democracy and sovereignty, as he frequently succumbs to an organicist vocabulary. We already heard that yesterday. So what is already indicated in his definition of the state being a special organ whose responsibility it is to work out certain representations which hold good for the collectivity, is consolidated when the state is not only called the very organ of social thought, but even the social brain. And this is not the only turn to this kind of imagery in his lectures. When speaking about the morally detrimental effects of an unregulated economic field calling for the creation of mediating professional groups, Durkheim's words live up to the project of writing a physique de murdered one. I quote, in the human body, all visceral functions are controlled by a particular part of the nervous system other than the brain. This consists of the sympathetic nerve and the vagus or pneumogastric nerves. Well, in our society too, there is a brain which controls the function of interrelationship. But the visceral functions, the functions of the vegetative life or what corresponds to them are subject to no regulative action. Let us imagine what would happen to the functions of heart, lungs, stomach, and so on, if they were free, like this all of all discipline. Just such a spectacle is presented by nations where there are no regulative organs of economic life. End of quote. 
So the imagery of the social body or the body politic is, as you know, no invention by Durkheim, but a recurring theme of the history of political ideas. While political orders can be symbolized by various images such as shepherd and fold as a governmental relation, pastoral power in Foucault's terms, or a beehive, a state ship and others, which all assume specific role functions and relations of power, corporeal images are likely to be the most frequent and most influential ones, very prominent in the famous frontispiece of the Hobbesian Leviathan, as we saw a moment ago, but already in Plato, Livius, and many others. So it must hardly be mentioned that this is no innocent imagery. When social order is somehow naturalized, every proclaimed dysfunction <coughs> threatens to lead to the sickness or even death of the social body, with the consequence that all disturbing elements must be erased to restore its health. And this thinking is not a unique feature of totalitarian regimes, but can also be found in Rousseau and others, by the way. Durkheim certainly does not strive for the physical elimination of dysfunctional members, yet his organicism has important consequences. Once the state is defined as the social brain, the ultimate distribution of rationality is settled. The representation of the state are klare et distincte, characterized by a, quote, higher degree of consciousness and reflection, where, whereas it is surrounded by the diffuse and obscure collective consciousness of society. This sounds like a deliberative democracy entirely imposed from above, but despite obvious elitist presuppositions, Durkheim does not develop a purely expertocratic model of government, trusting the happy few who are enlightened with the sole task of efficient goal attainment. Instead, there can be no reflexive democracy without feedback and accountability, as we will see. At this point, it might be helpful to say a bit more about the concept of deliberation or deliberation frequently used by Durkheim. As I said, deliberative democracy has become the most fashionable model of democracy during the last 30 years in the academic debate. While it is certainly true that there are as many models of deliberative democracy as there are theorists of it, most of them aim for rational decisions following a reflective, discursive process in Kantian, Habermasian or Rawlsian terms that champion the public use of reason. This is an important shift away from the reduction of politics to a power game and also from false conceptions of the political will as pre-political. The transformative potential of deliberation also changes the criteria of democratic <coughs> legitimacy, as Bernard Manin has argued 30 years ago, I quote, the source of legitimacy is not the predetermined will of individuals, but rather the process of its formation, that is, deliberation itself, end of quote. This transformative power of reasoning certainly fits Durkheim's criticism of a mere aggregative democracy that consists basically of counting votes as in his view, the quality of binding decisions or representations in his terms should be the core of democracy. Critics of deliberative democracy, however, have argued from the start and also shown empirically that the envisaged enlightened will is often an unattainable goal due to power structures, cultural and social factors getting in the way of the utopia of a Herrschaftsfreier Diskurs and the like. To be fair, there are many models of deliberative democracy that do not rely on such idealistic assumptions as in the Kantian or Habermasian mode, but nevertheless, the basic doubts about the virtues of deliberation persist. And as to the transformation and creation of the political will, one cannot simply ignore the danger and often daily experience of persons and groups manipulating our political categories and representations. Schumpeter, to be, to be sure, is one of the most pessimistic observers of the political process, being heavily disturbed by the experience of the totalitarian propaganda of his time when he says about the above-mentioned groups, I quote, these groups may, be, may consist of professional politicians or of exponents of an economic interest or idealists of one kind or another, or of people simply interested in staging and managing political shows. Human nature and politics being what it is, they are able to fashion and within very wide limits even to create the will of the people. What we are confronted with in the analysis of the political process is largely not a genuine but a manufactured will. 
and often the artifact is all that in reality corresponds to the volonté générale, volonté générale of the classical doctrine. So far as it is so, the will of the people is the product and not the motive power of the political process." End of quote. And I think this, this observation has not become obsolete as the discussion about a so-called post-democracy in, in the fashion of um, Jacques Rancière or Colin Crouch demonstrate, even if the label post-democracy has become itself, meanwhile, a bit of an academic fashion, I would say. Before I will turn a bit closer to Durkheim's conception of political will formation, one further linguistic aspect must be mentioned in order to understand Durkheim's relation to theories of deliberative democracy. I refer here to an observation by Yves Saint-Omer. When Durkheim frequent, frequently employs the term deliberation, that are almost entirely the privilege of the state, which is sometimes called deliberative in the lectures itself, the state is deliberative, this is not congruent with the meaning of the term in the English and German context. Deliberation can indeed refer to an argumentative and reflective process, but it can also just mean the taking of a decision, with or without deliberation. So the crux of contemporary models of deliberative democracy, that is, in which institutional designs, design forms of deliberation can be connected to authoritative decision-making, is sometimes difficult to discuss in French terms. For Durkheim, however, this would not have been a task worth pursuing at all, given his lack of interest in political institutions. Even more important, it was beyond question that the state, in its rather narrow form, is the only possible source of deliberation in the double sense of the word, so discourse and decision. Institutional designs with the participation of ordinary citizens were not part of this picture. Now there remain two questions which must be answers, answered. First, why should the people accept such a paternalistic mode of policy making? And second, and related to this, how does Durkheim conceive of the close commun communicative streams between state and society he was eager to achieve? So why should citizens respect the law? It's the title of the presentation. Durkheim generally calls the respect for the law a civic duty, but certainly does not plead for unconditional subordination. Such an authoritarian choice could not have been reconciled with his belief in personal autonomy and the cult of the individual he celebrates so vehemently in a statement during the Dreyfus affair. Furthermore, in his Leçon, he underlines that democracy does not only lead to the best decision, decisions, but that it is the political system that conforms best to our present-day notion of the individual. This is a quote. So this notion certainly does not exclude respect for authority, that is vital in order to avoid social chaos and enemy, but this authority has to be based on rational foundations. Thus, the problem of democratic legitimacy becomes central. Here again, another point of difference to Habermas and several further theorists of deliberative democracy emerges. To Habermas, legitimacy is intermingled with political autonomy. I quote, Citizens are political autonomous only if they can view themselves as the joint authors of the laws to which they are subject as individual addressees. End of quote. Quote by Habermas. This provokes a lot of problems concerning the concrete definition of authorship, actual or potential authorization of laws, forms of consent and dis disagreement and the like. Durkheim takes a different view. It is neither direct or indirect authorship, nor the already disqualified, volatile and unenlightened will of the people that is the source of legitimacy. Another quote. The true source of respect for the law lies in its clearly expressing the natural interrelation of things. The individual, especially in a democracy, will respect it only in the degree to which he recognizes it, it as having this quality. It is not because we have made a certain law or because it has been willed by so many votes that we submit to it. It is because it is a good one that is appropriate to the nature of the facts, because it is all it ought to be and because we have confidence in it. And this confidence depends equally on that inspired by the organs that have the task of preparing it. What matters then is the way in which the law is made, the competence of those whose function it is to make it, 
and the nature of the particular agency that has to make this particular function work. Respect for the law depends on the quality of the legislators and the quality of the political system." End of quote. This passage is not easy to grasp. For a start, how should we understand that the respect expresses the natural relation of things? Les rapports naturels des choses. Especially when following Durkheim's own impetus of developing a radical sociological view, it is not understandable how natural relations should play a role in this. Furthermore, this suggests somehow the ideal of, a, of an absolute correct decision and laws is kind of mirror of nature. The latter part of the quote, however, seemed to focus more on the quality of political procedures and institutions. In any case, Durkheim must give an answer how the citizens, whose political competence so far were not spoken highly of, shall be able to judge the quality of the lawmaking process in order to develop institutional confidence. The answer lies once again in the close communication between state and society. The particular advantage of a democracy, this is a quote, the particular advantage of a democracy is that, owing to the communication set up between those governing and the citizens, the latter are able to judge of the way in which those governing carry out their task and, knowing the facts more fully, are able to give or withhold their confidence." End of quote. To this end, there must be adequate communicative channels between state and society at the mass of individuals. The state must not be secluded as an arcane and partly sacred entity, but it has to bring its deliberations to the public. Another quote. Then everyone is able to realize the problem set and the circumstances of the setting and the at least apparent reasons that determine the decisions made. In this case, the ideas, sentiments, decisions worked out within the governmental organs do not remain locked away there. This whole psychic life, psychic life so long as it, is, as it frees itself, has a chain of reactions throughout the country. Everyone is thus able to share in this consciousness sui generis and ask himself the questions those governing are themselves. Everyone funds them or is able to. End of quote. Durkheim does not use the terms justification and accountability here, although they are imminent in these reflections. But even more important to him is the didactic function of the state, that is to make good decisions and to elucidate the collective consciousness of the citizens. Nevertheless, communication does not only flow into one direction. The state must be responsive in order to be informed about the citizens' opinions and needs. This, this respons responsiveness and openness is, however, embedded again into the framework of a paternalistic republicanism a la Francaise, as the goal is not simply, another quote, to arrive at what the society is thinking, but to discover what is in its best interest. To live up to this ambition, the state must be neither too detached from the individuals, neither too close. Quote, when the state stands too close to the individuals, it falls under their dominance and it is at the same time is in their way. End of quote. When Pierre Rosenvallon, who refers in his aforementioned book about democ democratic legitimacy to Durkheim's conception of close communication, envisages the social appropriation of political power or of the state, he goes far beyond Durkheim, who insisted on the strict autonomy of the state. Yet, Rosen Vallon follows Durkheim in insisting on the strict distinction between the governing and the governed that is sometimes effaced in Habermas theory. It is not the utopian identity of the author and the subject of law that Rosen Vallon is striving for, but for new modes of permanent representation beyond voting and opinion polls. As to those, those forms of representation, Durkheim theory is not very sophisticated. A peculiar feature of his normative model of democracy is a pro prolongation of his studies on the division of labor, as he highlights the necessity of professional groups as intermediary forces between state and individuals. An installation that should respond to the structural weaknesses inherited by the French Revolution that thoroughly abolished all kinds of intermediate bodies in the process of centralization. 
Dürkheim saw the not yet existing professional groups not only as a remedy for social enemy and as the cradle of solidarity, but as a political necessity in order to balance the relationship between state and individuals. But his narrow focus on professional groups revealed further weaknesses of Dürkheim's democratic framework. First, he has, unlike his predecessor and compatriot Tocqueville, no concept of a civil society. When Tocqueville asked for the virtues of intermediary forces in his observations on American democracy, he praises the spontaneous meeting and meetings and civil organizations in America as schools of democracy, in which citizens learn to reason and to act together. This didactic effect of political action diverges totally from Durkheim's approach in which the state is the only conceivable source of education. Second, Durkheim has no or just a crippled concept of the public sphere that has become so vital for the understanding of political systems whatsoever, and certainly for both normative and empirical approaches to democratic order. The concentration on the professional life of individuals and the structural effects of the division of labor is detrimental to the genuinely political issues democratic deliberations and decisions deal with. In the end, his theory is paternalistic and sometimes technocratic, I would say, as well as saturated by an unconvincing normativism that does not at all suit the proclaimed methodological positivism. A quote by Hans-Peter Müller, who sums this up quite well, I think. Durkheim lacks an account of the relationship between ideas and institutions, values and interests, groups and stratification and power structure. The imbalance which results in his sociological writing from the excessive weight given to moral regulation and the undervaluing of power and group interest is also responsible for the curious relationship in his political writings between normality and pathology, and for the paradoxical result that the normal is, in empirical terms, rare and exceptional, while pathological developments are empirically typical. So, it is no surprise that there are, unless for ardent supporters of classical French republicanism, finally only few inspirations for contemporary reflections about democracy. From a normative point of view, it is not defensible, defensible anymore to restrict the virtue of deliberation to political representatives and officials, instead of including, as Roson Volon and many others do, constitutional courts, citizens, juries, and many other institutions. To include this into the process of derivative will formation. And from an empirical point of view, Durkheim provides no categorical devices for understanding the power-infused dynamics of decision-making and will formation, or in general, political communication. So in the end, there are certainly important keywords in a theory that can be linked to debates, debates about democracy of today, but unfortunately, no adequate tools. Thank you.